Hello, my name is Petrina Nusky Small and my project is the Dwarf Tomato Project. I live in Australia and the person that I established the Dwarf Tomato Project with lives in the USA. And I would like to show you how I've processed seeds over the years, which I find to be very um, easy to do and quite different really from most of the videos that are available on YouTube. So I'll show you what I do. This is a variety called Marilinga. Marilinga in South Australia is in the desert of South Australia where the British set off atomic bombs back in the 1950s. And so this commemorates really what terrible things actually happened there, but I'll explain in a minute. Inside, usually it's uh, there's a vibrant patch of beetroot colour and often the beetroot colour is much bigger than that but it, it looked a little bit like an explosion of colour when I first named this variety. I'll just set that aside and show you the way I cut tomatoes when I save seeds because this is a little difficult to try to get the seeds out of it cut that way and I'll show you why I prefer this way. You can see the seeds are in a line down there when you cut wedges. And it looks like I'm just missing the, ah, it's a little bit easier to see there. I put it in a cup in order to get most of the gel and the juice and the seeds without making too much mess. Now I'm not getting the areas I want necessarily, but I'll show you how I cope with that as well. So that's just a way of scooping down the curve in the wedges. But when you can't really see some of the seeds, or you can see a little bit there, but sometimes you can't really see because of where you've cut it. But when you cut it that way, you can see a seed cavity that's embedded inside. And so it's quite easy to get them out that way. And as you can see, I'm building up a jug full of tomatoes from having deseeded some other varieties before this morning. Oops, nearly put the seeds in the wrong place. And sometimes if you push your finger, you can expose that curvature, that line of seeds and more easily get them out of the wedge. Look on that side. Yeah, I can see a few in there. And it doesn't matter if it gets all squishy. You're going to make something else, passata or, or ketchup or something with all the leftovers after you've finished. So that's a bit easier to see there, that you can just go around the curvature with your knife. And you can pull back that flap a bit and see that there's still a few more seeds. You don't have to get every seed. And that was the one I did earlier. I think there's probably a hidden cavity in there, perhaps. Oh, no, not necessarily. Sometimes, no, there's none there. Sometimes there'll be some hidden under a curve. I see one there. Just poke it out. Might cut that bit off. Okay, so that's uh, a largish tomato. I'd like to also show you a smaller tomato. So now I'm going to do a, a different tomato. This is a green when ripe tomato. And sometimes you only want to do one or two tomatoes rather than seed, you know, a group of tomatoes. And I'll show you 
what I do with this one. But first I'll cut it to show you how it looks. And it is ripe, even though it looks totally green. <laughs> so that's how it looks inside. Now I'll just show you um, what I do uh, for a smaller fermentation. Once again, I just scoop out the seeds from those cavities. It's fairly quick and easy. I might just poke that up from behind. It's easy to get the seeds. Often the smaller tomatoes have a lot more of these cavities and sometimes the cavities are actually quite large, which you probably notice of tomatoes that you buy in the supermarket. I have to cut off the writing. I write on my, my tomatoes with um, um, a pen so that I know what variety is. And this one I've written JB, which stands for Jade Beauty. It's very delicious when it's ripe, it's quite sweet. And the only way to tell it's ripe is that you really actually have to observe that the color changes slightly to a yellowish tinge from the green and it becomes quite shiny and so, you give it a little feel and if you feel a little bit of a, um, a give behind the pressure of your finger, you can assume that it's ripe. Sometimes you don't get every seed, there's a few hiding behind there. Doesn't really matter. Now there's quite a big cavity in there that I can't reach. So you can see that now I can actually get in there much more easily to scoop it out and around that side as well. And so that made it a lot easier than trying to struggle to get around the corner that you really couldn't get when it was a wedge. So much quicker. So that's that one tomato, I won't do the other. but. When you ferment tomatoes, a lot of the time in the videos that you see on YouTube, they are in takeaway cups that you can't see through. And I'll explain why I prefer glass and see-through cups in a moment. But they also sometimes have the tomato seeds of one little tomato in a great big cup. And because it has to sit and ferment for a few days, it evaporates and becomes completely almost dry. And so they always say to add water. I prefer that people don't add water because if you add water to a fermentation like this, you have a weaker type of fermentation. Whereas if you only have juice, the fermentation is quite strong and it kills a lot of diseases because it becomes highly acidic. I actually tested it and it was more acidic than vinegar. And that's advisable. So a tall glass with a small top is quite good. But you can see that some of mine are um, takeaway cups uh, because I had a lot more seeds. But if you've only got a few seeds, try to get a container that matches how many seeds you have. And of course, later on, I'll add the seeds from that other tomato. Um, I'll just label this. You must label, of course, otherwise you can't tell once they're cleaned, they all look the same. I'm just going to put JB because I, I know that that means Jade Beauty. So now I'd like to talk about the actual fermentations and why it's very beneficial to have a clear glass to look at, uh, to see what stage the seeds are at. And when the seeds are ready to uh, rinse clean, usually if you give it a tap or a shake, seeds start falling to the bottom 
and if they start falling to the bottom it usually means it's ready to rinse clean uh, if they don't fall to the bottom but they stay at the top we'll just see if this one oh they're falling to the bottom there that one's ready to rinse as well this has got some at the top and the bottom Although there are some at the bottom, I think there's still some gel around the seeds at the top. I'm not sure if that's quite ready. Or maybe I'll wait a few hours before I try rinsing that one. Uh, anyway, you'll soon learn from experience if it's the right time or not. More a dropping, it's probably okay. Uh, now I'm going to show you how I actually rinse the seeds clean and spread them out to dry. First thing is to remove the label, the stick on label, which is sometimes tricky, and put it on the plate. That way there's just no doubt that the seeds on this plate will be what the label says. So first I will tip all of these seeds and all of the mouldy, crusty top that was on the top into another container. Make sure I've got all the seeds. And now I'm going to try to spritz it with a bit of pressure, but that's a bit tricky. I need a teaspoon. And because it's so full, I think I'll stir it quite well. Normally the pressure of the water would do that. I just wait a little until the seeds settle down a bit to the bottom and as you can see all the mouldy cruddy stuff sort of floats ready to be poured off and i'm getting close to the seeds so i'll stop now and just give that a squirt let it settle a bit and pour off the top Sometimes you'll get little seeds pouring off the top, but they're usually the seeds that are a bit immature anyway and wouldn't germinate. You do this a few, um, a few times really until you get most of the debris out and then mainly it's just clear water and seeds. Some of those seeds look immature, so they'll go down the sink. But the main ones are staying at the bottom, as you can see. One more. Still a bit of crud coming out. That's good enough. All right, I'll just add a little bit more water so that it's easy to pour through the strainer. Make sure that you haven't got any seeds and I see there is a seed there because if you're doing lots of different varieties you don't want to leave this seed in for another variety that you're processing next. So I'm going to just make sure I've got all the last seeds. All clean. The same occurs here. I need to make sure I get all the seeds out of the strainer but they're just immature so I'll wash them away. Now generally I just spread it out here with the back of the strainer. Single, single layer as best I can. Then put it somewhere to dry. I usually keep them here on my kitchen table where I'm processing the tomato seeds. So here's the plate of seeds that we just processed and here I have another couple plates that have been drying for a few weeks now um, and as you can see there's a quite a lot on there and if I had any more seeds I would need to use a bigger plate and here's a few but as you can see they don't fall off 
but to get them off can be a bit of a challenge and I'll show you how I do it. So what I use is an old credit type card, plastic card, and I put my hand over the top of the seeds because they can tend to jump around. And you have to press quite hard, they're well stuck on. But now they're ready to be put into a paper envelope. I usually put them into paper for the first 12 months after I do seed saving. After that, I often pack them into packets ready for people who wish to buy seeds from the website. So that's how I process seeds for the Dwarf Tomato Project. And if you'd like to see more about the varieties that are in the project, go to dwarftomatoproject.net. Bye.